Well, good morning. morning. Who of you was not, were not here last week? Okay. The notes that you were given, you should have a paper that has summary of last week's message. Did you all get one of those? That will at least bring you up to speed on what we learned in this marvelous Psalm 73. I also was trying something new to also train us in how to study God's Word on our own. I had those who were here coloring last week. Did you enjoy coloring, ladies and gentlemen? We'll do that again in the future for a future passage. I would suggest if you were at Walmart or Kmart or whatever marts are out there, you get a selection of colored pencils for yourself that you can bring with you. You won't have to share that way, but you can have them to use. And I will also then walk you through some means by which to examine God's Word on your own. We're going to pick up on where we last, where last week in just a moment, but I invite you to also, if you have a Bible, bring it with you. If you don't have one, I'll talk to one of our Gideons and get one for you. In fact, tonight at chapel at Norwich, as the Catholic Mass ends and the non-denominational begins, the Gideons are there, and all of our students will get one to use for the balance of the year. I'm concerned that we need to be people of the book and know what God has to say, and if you can't afford one for yourself, we'll make sure that there's a Bible in your hand. The theme for last week from the psalm we looked at, Psalm 73, was when it seems that good guys finish last. I think all of us can relate to the content of that psalm, if not presently, at least in the past, and I'm certain at some time in the future. Just running very quickly through for those that were not here to bring you up to speed, we saw that Psalms has five different divisions or books each of those sections ends with a psalm that has a doxology in it, praising the Lord or blessing the Lord. Some believe that it was written that way to parallel the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch. And that we noticed in our study last week four steps that we engage ourselves in as we come to God's Word. Observation, what is there? Interpretation, what does it mean? Application, what do I do with it? And then proclamation, good, Jim, you're ahead of me. You're good. Uh, what's the point? At Norwich Chapel, and sometimes here the last slide is, so what? If we cannot answer that question, the work of Bible study was not done. Filling our minds with information is not the end. Taking what we learn and applying it to our lives is. There's one text in the Bible that says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And so there again, taking God's word, not to quote how many verses we have, not to show off, but to inculcate God's word into our lives. So when pressures come, when testings come, the Spirit of God brings the word to our mind and guides us thereby. It's incredible how God works through his word in our lives. What I proclaimed last week and end with as we begin our study this week from this particular psalm was when it seems that you or I are finishing last, whether or not it's true or not, when it feels that way to us, when we're tempted to do things the world's way, when our emotional and spiritual standing is rather shaky at best, when we find ourselves envying those who are not doing things God's way, and they seem to be getting ahead anyhow, when they're prospering and we are not, when bitterness begins to raise its ugly, ugly head, that's when, as the psalmist did, we should get alone with God in a place of solace, a sanctuary, to think with him and have him bring to our mind truths that probably we've heard before but are disregarding. We saw from this psalm that in doing so, the Lord promises to judge and punish those who are ungodly, who are wicked, who are not doing things his way. He's promised to continually be with us, that he is near, that he's got us by our right hand, or as we would say militarily, he's got our back, that he offers counsel and guidance to us. If prosperity escapes us, if ills trouble us, our destiny is secure. Glory is ours. Heaven is ours. And amidst our struggles, he strengthens us. And if we are last, he asks, as a verse that says, the last shall be first and the first last. I love some of those slides that have the heavens behind the words. 
I've said to my dear bride a number of times, I, I wish I could go into space, and Deborah smiles and says, one day you will. And I say, yes, that's true. What a destiny is ours. We found up to 12 key players in our study last week, depending how the groups are gathered together or not, the wicked, the arrogant, are they the same or different? We saw in terms of two particular individuals, he learned of God, that he's good, he's the most high. He places the wicked on slippery slopes. He brings them down to destruction. He is not just God, he's the Lord God, he's the master, he's in control. It's he who's with us and holds us amid our crises. It is he who's available to counsel and to guide and it is he who receives us into his presence in glory. Heaven's a wonderful place, but it's wonderful because he's there. Asaph, the writer who we'll learn more about this morning, came close to stumbling. He'd almost slipped. He hadn't gone over the edge yet, but he is right there. He's envying the prosperity of others. He believes he's kept his heart pure for no reason, verse 13, while back in verse 1, he affirmed that God was good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. And he's thinking, I've seen you do that with them. Where do I fit into this equation? He's bitter. He's inwardly wounded. He's acted in a senseless way. He realizes he does not know everything. I'm an ignorant individual. I need knowledge and understanding. And he describes himself in verse 22 as a beast, I would say, snarling back at God. We have been there, haven't we? Haven't we? And so this psalm, which we looked at last week and today, is one that is of relevance I go back to it many times in my walk with the Lord and in the pastoral ministry and chaplain ministry I'm honored to have. The contrast was he knows that God is good to those who are pure in heart and he's seen in his own life, I'm doing that, but for what end? And his temptation, having been stricken all day long, having been chastened every morning, he's kept his musings to himself, but he's deeply troubled. He has still gone to the sanctuary of God. He's seeking God's counsel and guidance. He knows God's presence is near and that God's his refuge. And the psalm ends in verse 28. Rather than proclaiming his woes, I want to proclaim the works of God. Had we seen a change in the conditions around him when this psalm ends? No. But there was an incredible change in his heart in what he had seen. Those are the characters that we saw. The contrast that he saw that God was good to Israel, not to him. The temptation not to follow through what he was doing. Thinking through everything in God's presence while his situation's unchanged, his perspective undergoes a radical transformation as he perceives their end. I also gave to you in the handout last week four different translations of this particular passage, and if you did take the opportunity to compare them this week, you found some differences. Some wording that is really quite different, and one wonders, so why in the English Bible is it so different? I will not get into all of that on this particular psalm. We'll use other texts in the future for that end, but observe that that is true. Why do those translations differ? There are dynamic translations where the translators try to get the essence of a passage. I'll put it this way, a superfluity of vacuous verbiosity, a lot of empty words. One you grasped, one probably you didn't. To be precise, we take the first statement, but we try to render it in a way that others can understand. Professors at Norwich should do that. Sometimes they don't. You hope that they will eschew obfuscation, not be unclear. Sometimes they try to muddy the things up. And so we'll look at that in future days and how you can choose a translation for yourself. But let me say this. Whatever Bible you're going to read and understand, use it. I have a friend who's reading the children's version of the Bible through because it resonates with her. Go for it. 
Remember the Bible stories we heard in Sunday school that we still can recall? Here again, exposing ourselves to God's word to make a real difference. What we move on to this morning is no coloring today, but that will happen in the future, to expose you to a tool that I learned to use almost half a century ago. 95% of the work that your interim pastor does is from a concordance. What's a concordance? Let me start with two men who did some years ago based on the King James Version, Robert Young and also James Strong. A concordance is an alphabetical listing of all the words in the Bible. A, of, Abraham, all the way through, through Z. And what these gentlemen did back in the 1800s initially was take out their English Bible, and I'm sure multiple pieces of paper list all the times the word A was in Scripture, all the times that Jesus was in Scripture, or Christ, you're looking at their life's work when you see those concordances. By computers today, they could do it in a matter of moments, more than likely. But this allows us, for example, studying on marriage. What does the Bible say about marriage? You could find the word marry, married, marriages, weddings. Find those texts, list them on a piece of paper, and then sit down as you go through each verse to discern what does the Bible have to say on those particular topics. I try to do that before I go to the commentaries. My conviction is the Bible sheds a lot of light on the commentaries. <laughs> we sometimes go to the commentaries first and to the Bible last. And the work of scholars, those who've devoted their lives to learning the languages and the culture of the first century and before, that's extremely valuable. But we're still drawing upon their work even if it's deep, it's milk for us because we're just digesting what was pre-digested. When you take meat and no one's chewed it first, you have to chew on it and think about it. But have you found when you wrestle through a topic and finally get it, you've got it for life because you've had to wrestle it through? Same thing here. So these two men who got the ball rolling in our culture and language, I give great credit to because that's a life's work that they did. There are at least 66 zero English translations available, including the Cotton Patch translation. With Jimmy and Petey, uh, it, it really is kind of a ride. We don't need more English Bibles. We have folks around the world that need the Bible in their language, hence Wycliffe Bible Translators doing a great job. I put on the screen there some that are in my library and some I recommend. A concordance is based upon a particular version. In the first verse of this psalm, we saw one reference to Israel in three of the translations. If you have that first verse, I think it's the RSV does not have the word Israel at all, does it? What's the word used there at the phrase at the end of verse one? Who can tell me? The upright. What right did they have to change Israel to that, or what right did the other translators have to take the upright to Israel? I've not answered the question yet, but do you see the difference? If I was using the RSV concordance, and I have an NASB Bible, and I go to my concordance, I won't find the word I'm looking for, because it's not there. I have to be certain that this tool, and I have copies of concordances up here in the front to look at after service, you can see what I use. It has to fit with what version we're using, or we can't do our work. But in so doing, here's an example of one page on the screen. We start by looking for the word that's of consideration. I've chosen the word love. Law, I see love. What is love? If you're working on premarital counseling with young people, you may certainly know what it is. It is not a feeling. It's a commitment, isn't it? And the foundation for a relationship is trust. I love my truck, I love my skis, I love astronomy, I love my wife. The word love was used in different ways in that sentence. Or it better be used in different ways in that <laughs> sentence, right? And so we start by, you're reading a verse in scripture, how about one you all know, John 
For God so loved the world. Does his love change? He so loves now and just loves then? In my concordance studies, I found that the real stress of that verse is in this manner God loved the world. His love doesn't change. That was an eye-opener to me. The particular manner in which he showed his love was he gave his son. That resonates with me. So if you were considering what is true love, you've seen that film. Who does not know what I'm doing there? Princess Bride. Marriage is what brings us together today. Right? Great film. True love. Wesley and Buttercup. I could take out a concordance if I'm considering marrying someone, ask of myself, do I really love her? From your exposure to scripture, what chapter would come to your mind that I better read? 1 Corinthians 13. It's called the love chapter. Sandwiched between chapters 12 and 14 where St. Paul is addressing a divisive church. Isn't that interesting? On spiritual gifts. And right in the middle, he stops his discussion, talks about love, and love is patient, which means I put up with what drives me nuts, or I'll wait. So if I was looking at love, I might say, huh, is Rev patient or not? Is Rev kind? Does Rev keep a record of wrong suffered? If I do that, I'm not really in love with the people or with the wife. I better consider it. You can get that by taking a concordance out. You're reading the passages of Scripture. Huh, I think I know what that word means. Let me find out what it means in this passage. And where is it used elsewhere? How can I understand this particular word? So after looking at the word, you go on to say, where are the texts where it can be found? Now, be advised, we can take this task on and never get done. We could do it never. So how is this word used in the same verse or in the same section or the same chapter, the same book? If I was doing the Gospel of John and the clock was running, I'd see how is the word love used throughout the Gospel of John? Just for this week, I'll spend my time there. And I'll find out what the author was trying to convey through the Spirit of God's inspiration about that topic. If I have more time, all right, I would do then books by the same author. Gospel of John, what else is by John? First John, second John, third John, and Revelation. Then books of the same kind, the epistles, St. Paul, his letters to the churches, or all the books of the New Testament, or of all the Old Testament, and then the entire scripture. We can take and do a really extensive study on this, which I love to do, but often in the summertime when I have the time to pull that off. Taking and looking at words are important, the whole corpus of Scripture. And I will also show, I won't do it in this message, in the concordance there's also a number after each verse, which gives the number for the underlying Hebrew or Greek word. So I can say, what does it mean in the original? Let me give an example. Is there a controversy when one reads the book of Genesis? Yes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Evening, morning, one day. 24-hour day. Does it say 24 hours in the text? It does not. Is there ever a 24-hour day? No. Every four years is a leap year. Is there not to adjust days and calendars? And the earth's rotation is actually slowing down. Did you know that? Not a problem for a few billion years, but it is slowing down. So if I come and say it says 24 hours, is that observation or is that interpretation or I'm reading into the text what it says? Now it could be. I won't say it can't be. God can do what he wants. I saw a t-shirt that says, I believe in the Big Bang. God said it and bang, there it was. I work with that. <laughs> but let's try a couple of things as we look at that underlying Hebrew or Greek word. On the sixth day God made man, correct? And out of his rib made a wife, Eve. What time of day did God make Eve? Probably the Eve. I'm sorry, it's not right. Nope. <laughs> but let's say, makes man, he names all the critters, makes the wife, they're tempted to sin and fall in that one same day. And there's no LED lights at nighttime, so it's, let's consider it's a long summer day, June 21, so it's dark at about 10 o'clock at night. 
We're putting a whole lot in that one day, aren't we? And in chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Such was the creation of the world in the day that God created the heavens and the earth. In chapter 2, the author there takes the word day and puts days 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, however long they may be, and puts the word day over all of them in chapter 2, verse 4. So I have to at least say it's not the same meaning for day in the second chapter as the first in that one verse. Uh-oh. So we have to come to a text to read it, observe it, and ask questions about it. I'm a temporal agnostic. I'm an astronomer. God could do it momentarily, but I have no problem with eons of time either for the creation of a great universe. I don't. We're trying to rule out the evolutionary hypothesis, the macroevolutionary hypothesis that rules God out. But I don't know how God did it. One day with the Lord's like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. There it is. If I say to you, for example, let's meet together at 7.30. Okay. What's the problem with that statement? Oh, a day, that's good. But what else is it? Let's say, aha, I like military time. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So you show up at 7.30, elders meeting, Reb, where was breakfast? Well, I'm going to see you tonight for supper. And so we can think we're being clear. Someone's calling my phone. That's my phone that was not turned off, okay? Got it. Or let's say this, after the service I say, hey, you come here. What's the problem with the question? Who's you? Is it you? You? Down south they've solved the problem. Y'all. Our Christmas gift last year from my sister-in-law, Merry Christmas, y'all. So even there, we think we have the word, but what does it mean? I'm giving this as an introduction as we come to God's word. Words are important. In fact, I believe in verbal plenary inspiration, that God chose the words for the authors as well. That's why I'm a very stickler in terms of studying theologically what God's word has to say. What does the Hebrew word mean? What's the Greek word mean? We also have the problem of words themselves. Homonyms, words having the same spelling and pronunciation but different meanings. Let's try this, the word fly. Got him. Or let's fly. One's an insect, one's a verb. Without a context, I don't know what we're talking about. How about rose? One's a flower, one's getting up. How about date? Something we eat or something we do? Or trunk? Elephant trunk, tree trunk, travel trunk, swimming trunk, human body trunk, car trunk. If I have one conception of what trunk means, I can really mess up a passage of scripture, can I? So as I start with this, as we come to God's word, believing his truth is there, I have to ask, what is the truth that you want me to learn? And before I impose upon God's passage what I believe it is, and it's easier the older I get, I start with a blank mind. When you get older, you know, you forget so much because the hard drive has so much data already, it can't hold it anymore. That's why we can't remember things when we're older. I have to discipline myself, even after years of study, to come to a new passage and say, for a moment, forget you've read anything. Start fresh. Look at this. There is words that have the same spelling, same pronunciation. Homophones, they spell different, mean different. The word alter, if you're a seamstress, fixing a dress for a wedding, altering the dress, or alter. That's not a dress, is it? Or eight, a number, or what we did before church this morning, downstairs. Good food this morning, by the way, good food. Eight, or red, a color. I wore this deliberately this morning for red. Or in looking down at your notes, you just read. Spelled differently, different meanings. The last type of words, homographs, they sound differently, it's spelled the same way. The word W-O-U-N-D. After a football game, you may have some of those, wounds. 
or after you've gone fishing, you wound up the line. W-I-N-D. Or wind it up. B-A-S-S. If you're a fisherman like Pastor Neil Laybourne, it's a fish. If you're a vocalist, it's where you sing in the choir. Are you a bass, treble, soprano? So I'm giving this as a start to give you why this is important. Do you understand why it's important to understand words? The software beyond just these books allows us to do phrases too. If you have a Bible on an iPod or iPad or computer, you could type in day of the Lord, not just day and Lord and do all those. You could put a phrase together, which one of your assignments this week was look at the pure in heart. That was in verse 1 and verse 13. I've got that ready for us here. It's a lot faster if you have software or a tool rather than going through all the times it has the word pure and all the words that have heart to say, where does it say pure in heart? That saves me some time. But I do that because, as we saw in this passage, he's frustrated in that God's good to those who are pure in heart. He's been doing that, but senses it's been to no avail. So if God is good to those who are pure in heart, I'd like to know what it means to be that way so God can be good to me. All right, let's go to work then, in the concordance study. I had you circle the first person yes, last week a name. Who was it? Asaph, not Aesop's fables, not the same, but A-S-A-P-H. We learned about him, his struggle, but there's a lot about him we did not know. And so I spent some time this week with my concordance, going through all of the scripture, each verse where the name Asaph was used to try to find out who this man is. Or is it the same name, different men? Let's play with your head for a moment. Please get Bill a cup of coffee. Who could that be in our church? Bill Reed? Bill Richardson? The Rev? Bill Witt? I, I am named Bill, for those who don't know. <laughs> so you'd say, which Bill? As I come to Asaph, I will not answer this question for you, but what I have found, I did not try to resolve, I'll leave it for you, is all that I found about this individual one person or not? Now, if it's in the same book, probably the same person time-wise, although in my family, my grandfather was Bill, my father was Bill, my uncle was Bill, I'm Bill. My brother is Bob, my cousin is Rob. Guess my uncle's name, what it was. Rob. Our son's name, Christopher. We changed that one fast. <laughs> Which Bill? Which Bob? Here's what I found in going through a concordance. Notice on your paper, you'll see under Asaph a lot of verses. Can you see that? You're saying, Rev, you aren't going through all those verses. No, I'm not going to, please. And the rest of them, you have some homework coming up this week. Be ready for that. But I've taken all those verses under Asaph. Here's what I found. I learned from doing those verses his father's name, Berechiah, a relative's name, Heman, He-Man. Children, perhaps six of them. Or perhaps they're different Asaphs with other kids. I didn't resolve that one yet. I learned that he was a recorder. Now, back in those days, there weren't tape recorders. There weren't digital recorders. There weren't microphones. It seems he was a curator of the family, keeping a record or of what was happening there in Israel. A statistician, if you will. He was also a seer. No, not quite that seer looking at me. That was someone who was a prophet who could see things beforehand. He's a Levite. Tribe of Levi, what about them? You could do a study on Levite and learn more about him. He's a contemporary of King David. He was assigned his role by the king. Who also wrote some psalms besides Asaph? David. The king had him minister before the Ark of the Covenant. He also had Asaph set aside his sons for the same task. He was one of the Levitical singers. Oh, he could sing. He'd be on our worship team. In fact, my contention is he was in the original worship team in the temple. First Chronicles 16, 7, by the way. He sang in the house of the Lord. He appointed others to sound loud cymbals. I like that. 
So probably during the service when some folk in the back row had kind of fallen asleep, he may have had a symbolist back there and just points and crash! <laughs> They're awake. He was a leader of the singers of songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. Oh, do you recall what I said the Psalms in general were? The songbook of the Israelites. Put into a meter. So they, there weren't Bibles printed back then, before the Gutenberg Bible. So put into meter, he's putting God's truth to song. In fact, he is the chief of those with musical instruments. One text talks about subsequent history after he's no longer on the scene. King Hezekiah and his officials ordered the Levites, of whom he had been one, to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. They took what we had and they were using this passage of scripture and putting it to song. What have we learned? That he shares, as we read, his life situation but his overall role was to help his people sing praises to God. In fact, he wrote Psalms 50 and 73 through 83. Each one starts with a Psalm of Asaph. Now we know something about our author. It doesn't change your spiritual life unless we think of it this way. Wendy and the team, do you enjoy their work, by the way? I do. Wendy, what was your concern when you began doing that this year after Tom and his dear bride left? That you wouldn't measure up to what they'd done? Clay, where are you? Yeah. Did you worry about that? Have you noticed that they exchange instruments often in the last song on the Sunday? That she's on the piano, he's on the guitar? They're stretching themselves. I commented to Clay before the service, I love the fact that our church here is biblical and whacked in the head. We, we laugh, don't we? <laughs> we try things. Leroy, can, can we go back, Jim, to that earlier thing that I missed? Sure. Oh, he didn't go in the order of the service. Shame on you. <laughs> Who noticed? Did you notice, Jim? Yes, he did. <laughs> so, the precision can flow if it's a real time, can it? Now, I've got notes, more than we'll need. I have next week's notes already prepared here, too. My goal in this, again, is to train you not only to learn from God's Word, but to learn from it yourself. Are you with me so far? Okay. We had a phrase in verse 1. Do you see it in verse 1? God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. In verse 13... What is Asaph's concern, and may I add, what is our concern? Two things. If you're doing it, I guarantee not everyone's seeing prosperity in our church family. Or we're asking, if I'm not doing that, how do I accomplish that? That ought to be our question, correct? In, if you look at that verse on the back page, I think wherever it has for the term pure of heart, the phrase, do you see a lot of verses? Probably you do. I've boiled it down for you. Here's what I found in my study. From Habakkuk, that God's eyes are too pure to approve evil, which means if I'm not being pure in heart, he can't approve what I'm doing. He can't look on wickedness with favor. Job, who had a pretty tough ride, did he not? What's one of the major questions he asked throughout his 40-some chapters? Why? Is questioning God, is asking why a sin? Who also asked why in a time of duress and difficulty? Where? On the cross. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He's quoting from an Old Testament psalm, by the way, which goes on to say, you will not abandon me. He's asking the question that we would ask, but he's affirming the answer by quoting the opening line. I think it's Psalm 22, I believe it is. He's quoting scripture in a very difficult time. But Job asks in chapter 15, what's man that he should be pure, one born of a woman, that he should be righteous? He says, who am I to think I'll be pure ever? 
In chapter 4, same book, can mankind be just before God? Can man be pure before his maker? Answer, no. Not in our own steps. Has to come from somewhere else. In Proverbs, who can say I've cleansed my heart that I'm pure from sin? I'd like to see the hands of all of us who have cleansed our hearts and are pure of sin. Really? I want to talk to your parents, Clay. I think they may have a different, you're playing with me. Okay, I got it. Which also shows he's listening too. Or the end of Proverbs, almost the last chapter, the 31 Pro, uh, proverb chapters. In chapter 30, the writer says this, there's a kind who's pure in his own eyes, but is not washed from his filthiness. I'm okay, I'm fine. Really? Let's take it one step further. Who of us stood before a mirror this morning? Who should have? <laughs> I get behind the mirror and I say, I disagree with you. And the mirror says, fine, go to church that way and see what they say to you. I allow the mirror to tell me the truth. In being pure in heart, God can't approve when it's not but who are we to think we can pull it off on our own? We can't. So I asked myself, then what can I do? What should I think that moves me in that way? Continuing in those verses that are before you, I found the following. It's by one's deeds and conduct that one is shown to be pure. Gentlemen, as for me and my mouse, we will serve the Lord. Some of the most prominent sites on the web involve what? Pornography. My computer screen faces glass doors in my office, right, Jeremy? Jeremy's my assistant. What have I given to you every year, Jeremy, to have from me? A piece of paper? My accountability questions. And I travel this month to Minneapolis, and Jeremy's to ask when I get back, what'd you watch on television or media or the other forum, Rev? He's commanded by me to ask every time. Why? We don't have some of the things that hotels have in our home deliberately. And to be pure, I'm disallowing my privilege of trying those. I don't want to go there. If you or ladies, I know it's a real world too, if you're going that way, it's not pure. So, covenanteyes.com, other things that will show friends where you went to on your computer and for how long, you can do that. I get input from guys where it shows where they went on their computer each week and for how long. They're serious about purity. Our deeds, our actions, Proverbs 21, it refers to our conduct that is right. The hardest option is always the right one. I've tried to find an exception to that and I've not yet thought of one. Pleasant words are pure. What did I just say? How did I say it? Is it profane? Is it biting? That's not pure. Job says, my prayer is pure. Am I praying for God to smash and crash somebody else who's getting ahead or say, Lord, keep on blessing them, but would you bless me too? So what's entailed in personal purity? Conduct. Second thing, acquaintance with and application of God's word. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, oh, what do you know about Psalm 119? Longest psalm chapter in Scripture. And he asks in that psalm, how can a young man keep his way pure by keeping it according to your word? He realizes exposure to God's word, knowing it, becomes a guidebook. If we're not in the word, we're going to mess up even accidentally from what God would have us do. So in terms of how to keep our ways pure, it's exposure to an application of God's word. Peter writes, like a newborn baby, long for the pure milk of the word. Start with basic stuff before you get to the heavy stuff. Just, Lord, fill my mind with what you have to say. The psalmist says, the commandment of the Lord is pure. It enlightens the eyes. Oh, that's what you'd have me do? Fine. Let's do that, Lord. Paul writes to Timothy in the first letter to that pastor, the goal of our instruction is love, 
from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. I would say for every sermon in our church, the goal is to be a loving body, along with the fact we're seeking purity of heart, which means the deepest recess of our being, not superficial, a good conscience, please make certain I'm hearing what's right or wrong from you, Spirit of God, because I could get it wrong, and a sincere faith that's genuine, I'm not playing with this, I want to do this. That explains a bit to me about what pure in heart might mean back here in this psalm. James says, wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then reasonable. It's first of all pure. God is not going to direct us where it's wrong. So my first question when I don't know what's pure is say, Lord, as I look at this decision, let me read in your word, let me pull my concordance out and see what you've given in your word, what purity involves, and I've given some ideas now. I list that and say, okay, if I do that right, the things I'm not sure about, I probably won't go that way because where it's very clear, I'm obeying you. Do you see how a concordance study can take a phrase and give some more insights to what it may mean? Purity also involves a consistent, a persistent relationship with not just information about God. James writes, draw near to God, he will draw near to you, purify you, your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded, I don't know what to do. He says, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Lord, I don't know what to do. Would you show me the right thing? Because I'm confused here. I'm punting the ball to you. You have an obligation to show me what's right or wrong if I'm not sure. If we truly ask that question, God's truly going to answer. Wives are told in Titus to be sensible and pure. I think that includes how gals dress, just so you know. Guys can have their minds go different ways, sometimes because they're wrong what they do, but also because they're shown things they ought not be seen. Young people, 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lusts. You may have to study what are lusts in Scripture to get that more clear. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. If you're Lord, your master, your commander-in-chief, I want my heart to stay pure. What are these tendencies, these lusts that could suck me in that I should run from? Consistent relationship with God, not just knowledge about him. Separating ourselves from worldly practices. James 1, 27. Keep yourself unstained from the world. Before we go see that film, go on web and see what's it rated and why. I will see an R film if it's a war film. I know it's bloody. I will not see an R film because it's sexual. I will not do that. And Deb and I watch those films together, not alone. Keep yourself unstained. God, I messed up. Yes, and you didn't ask me for my guidance, did you, Ref? This is a proactive, daily struggle, is it not? but it can be done. Pure of heart, it means we are evaluative, we're protective of our thought life and motivation. Our thought life? From Philippians chapter 4, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence or things worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Does the film fit that category? Does the book fit that category? Does the television program fit that category? Garbage in, garbage out. Purity of heart also affects the innermost part of our being. It's not just superficial. And with it, it promises blessedness, happiness, and a promise of a genuine relationship with God. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Not only ultimately, but they'll see God's work in their lives or our lives right now. 
The psalmist says, who can ascend to your holy hill? Who can stand in your holy place? Those who are pure in heart. Now, I'm going to stop our study there. I've got more notes, but I did it so I could carry it on next week and not take too much time. We've looked at words, meanings, tools, taken a phrase which was not really defined in that particular passage of Psalm 73, was it? So I took those concepts and traced it through Scripture. I also said, because I had the time, let me just run the word pure and the word heart. Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. So there's a major challenge for God to clean up my heart and yours. But with our desire as seen by Asaph, who can stand before God as pure? Those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, who realize I'm a sinner and need a Savior in Christ, says, hello, I'm that. So in preparation for our next time, I'm going to pass that. We're looking at envy next time. We're looking at what it is to covet or be content. We'll look at arrogance and pride. We're going to stay in this passage for a few weeks yet to sort of see what did we not yet see that is important to understand. Then I move on to a different text. There it is. This also means what? Oh, what? Yeah, I'm about done. See? <laughs> right? And it's a little bit, it's time to end. In your notes, do you see different categories there listed on the back page? Arrogance, pride, pick one. I've done at least a listing of verses for you. Take your Bible out, take a piece of paper, and just jot down, begin to organize what you see. You know that next week's passage will be Psalm 73. Although not completely, we're taking what is mentioned there and trying to expand our view. What does it mean elsewhere in Scripture so I can maybe understand better what is not defined here, but it's mentioned here? If you do one of those words when I'm teaching next week, some of you will be saying, let's see if he found what I found. Rev, you missed this. Really? Oh, that's good. I missed that. If I don't get to your term next week, uh, I have two more weeks to work on it. I'll, I'll see what he's got then. Then it becomes the basis for a small group Bible study. We don't share our ignorance. What do you think it means? Well, I think it means this. I don't care what we think it means. What does it mean? And there are times we'll get where we're not quite sure. Back to the opening illustration on day. I have wonderful believing friends who are early earth, late earth people. They all love the Lord. I wasn't there. It's a great universe to study. I do that with my observatory. But some questions, like if you had any question about being pure in heart, we found enough today we can apply. We saw last week if we're struggling, get a quiet place, go there, turn off the iPod, turn off the radio, say, Lord, I don't pour my heart, heart out to you, know how I'm feeling, but remind me of where you are, where I am, what you can do. And although the situation doesn't change, our mindset does. When we go out and proclaim his works. Closing illustration, Laurie is concerned for her brother in Florida. I'm concerned for my family. What's the first thing you asked of us when you arrived this morning, Laurie? Ask for prayer. We can't do a thing. Oh, yes, we can. We can pray. And we did. I shared with our elders, we heard about Kathy's loved one passing away. So I asked over here for news, make sure we pray for her during today. I know why she's not here. It's tough losing a loved one. But if we had not prayed for her and someone found out or she found out we knew and didn't pray, we failed in our responsibility. This is taking observation, interpretation, application, proclamation. We do that. We grow in God's word and we grow in our walk with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. 
Thank you for the attention of these dear friends. Thank you for the excitement of your word that does give us the guidance we need. We pray this with thanks in your name. Amen.